stop singing your name because you are worthy of our praise, God.
right, amen. You can be seated. We'll worship some more during our response time after our message is done today. But I'd just like to welcome you all to Silver Creek Fellowship. It's great to see you all here this morning, whether you are here in person or watching online live right now. We're just, we love to gather together. We love to be in the presence of the Lord together, to worship our King and our Savior Jesus, to, to grow in our understanding of His Word. It's good to be gathered together with the family of God. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So... This would be a great time in our message, uh, in, the, in our service, we're not to our message yet, for you to pull out your connection card and to fill this out for us. Remember, there's bins there in the back. You can also do this online. And what uh, I would love to remind you of is on the back side of this, there's a spot for your prayer requests and answers to prayer. And each and every week, we pray through all of these cards individually. We don't pray over them. We pray, actually, we read your requests, we pray through these And friends, I can just tell you, we see God moving. We see God answering prayers. We get to celebrate when you put things in the top, and then eventually it moves down here to the answered uh, to prayer. So please take some time, fill those out. You can drop those in the bin in the back on your way out today. Those are the same bins that if you came today prepared to give tithes and offerings, you can put those in the bins. You can also give in lots of different ways here at Silver Creek, online, through the app, by text. Just stop by the info desk if you need help with any of that. Now I want to tell you, um, there's a few things. I'm gonna, in a minute, I'm going to ask my friend Mark to come and talk a little bit about today's small group rally. But before that, I want to tell you that this week is a full week for us. We have our trunk or treat uh, happening here tomorrow night. If you have uh, kids that you want to come and uh, really have a good time, or neighborhood kids or grandkids that you want to come and uh, just have a, a blast from 5 to 7, we'll be here handing out loads of candy um, you get to see some creativity and some cars that are decorated and costume. You can come have a lightsaber fight with me dressed up as Darth Vader if you want. That's not a joke, by the way. That's real. That's happening. Okay? So we will just invite you to come on down. One other thing I want to tell you is then on Tuesday, Jeff and I will be boarding uh, airplanes headed for Africa. Uh, we'll be in Africa for a week. And then in order to not do multiple trips this year, Um, I'm branching off on our way home from Africa and going to Poland, where I'll be doing so. I'm going to be translated from uh, English into French, but in Africa, and then we'll go to Poland and go English to Polish and Ukrainian. So it's going to be quite um, the trip for us. And so here's what I'm asking for you to do, church. I want to tell you another piece of news, too. While I'm there in Poland, I am taking with me a gift from you where we are purchasing for 230 Ukrainian refugee children living at a summer camp outside Lviv, Ukraine. We are buying new coats and winter bibs for 230 kids living in this camp. That's from you guys. It's awesome. That puts us now over $30,000 that we pumped from the Ukrainian relief fund that you've given towards directly into uh, helping and and relieving the terrible suffering that's happening there all through the local church. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you've done. Now, one other note that I'll ask you is I we need your prayer. It's one thing to go on these trips, but I have no desire to go on this trip and not go with somebody who's covered by, covered in, and sent by uh, uh, your prayer. So if you could do me, uh, we'll use technology for our good here. If you would take your phone and set a reminder for yourself throughout the week, whether it's a daily reminder, whatever the rhythm is for you, I'm asking you while we're gone from now leaving on Tuesday, I'm back the 11th, I'm asking you if you would consider to have a regular rhythm where for a minute or two you would stop and you would pray for us on this trip. I just believe that it it makes all the difference in the world. We want to go sent by and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So would you please pray and be remembering us in prayer while we're there. Now, Mark is going to come. Today is the long-awaited small group rally, and Mark is going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, thank you, church. And yes, uh, you know, we, go, we come here and we do church together, and this is great, and it's awesome to see everybody in their faces. And, and I got to say, I'm, I'm glad to see all these little tags and a lot of people. But um, today we're doing a small group rally, and it's in our small groups where we do life together. And we want you to be a part of a small group. So please consider wandering around out in the lobby. But in the meantime, I want to ask a couple of people, what is it that you love about your small group, Tim? Can you stand up? Yeah, I will. 
I've been part of a small group for like 20-some years, and now I'm leading a group. But I think the beauty of it is this world is calling people to be individual and spend your own time and do your own thing. But in the scripture, it talks about them meeting daily and, and fellowshipping. And I think the beauty of small group is it's a place where you can fellowship. Often there's food, there's friendship, and time for prayer. And we've seen God move in families' lives and, and uh, children being blessed through the ministry of small group. And so if you're not part, I really encourage you. It's the best thing you're ever going to spend time on. Thank you, Tim. And I've been asking people around the room, what's, what are this, their favorite thing about small groups? The number one answer so far has been food. So, um, hey, so the Coxons have been involved in small groups. What, what is you love about small groups? Well, we've all been part of small groups for over 20 years here, and we've been in a variety of small groups. And it's just a great, great way to get to know people because you have four or five people in a church. You can't get to know people that way. But the small groups, you have that opportunity to get to know people. And I remember back when our kids were little, uh, they just loved small group. They couldn't wait to go to small group, meet their friends and stuff. So it's just a, not just for adults. It's also for the whole family. All right, thank you. If you're not in a small group, come do life with us and join a small group out in the lobby. Thanks, Mark. So after the service today, we're going to be out in the lobby. Some of us have even got bribes, I mean treats that you can stop by. Uh, Have a treat, meet some people, find out if there's a group that would work for you. I just cannot highly encourage you. If you don't know my heart for this, listen to last week's message. I believe with all my heart that God is calling us to be a church that gives ourselves to each other, and in doing so, that we build the kind of authentic community that God designed us to live in. Okay, so here we are. We're on the final week of our sermon series as we've been working together through the Apostles' Creed. Over the last, for eight weeks now, we've read this creed together, and when we're saying the creed, one of the things that I just love is we are really speaking against a lot of the popular narratives of our day. We are claiming that there is such thing as truth, and this is what that truth looks like. And that is not a popular way of living or thinking in our modern world. We are saying that our um, allegiance lies to a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are saying that there is absolute real truth, and I believe in it. So let's just start the last, the final time through this series. Let's begin by reading together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. All right, so let's jump right in. We covered uh, quite extensively the forgiveness of sins, in both of our message dealing with Jesus' death and resurrection, okay? So today I'm going to focus on the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. But before we jump into this final message in the series, I want to remind you on why we did this in the first place. I want to remind you on why we said all the way back in the very first message why this series was so important to our church and the season of life we find ourselves in. In the very first message that I preached, I said, as a pastor of this church, my heart was to see you all living lives filled and marked by freedom. Freedom in your parenting, freedom in your marriages, freedom in your finances, freedom in your relationships, freedom in every single area and walk of life. Because we know, friends, in this life, there's all kinds of stuff that messes us up and ties us up and tangles us up and trips us up. All kinds of things that the enemy wants to use to keep you held in bondage and confusion and doubt. 
And Jesus told us the antidote to all of that. He said, if you want to be free, if you want to live a life of freedom, he told us, John 8, 31 through 32, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You see, friends, this is why what we believe, I'm going to use a different word here, and it might scare you at first, but I'll help you understand. This is why our theology is so important. Because remember, theology is just this. Theo and ology, it's the study of God. Theology is just what we believe is true about God. So, led by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, we are called as believers to be maturing constantly in our faith. Maturing to understand God's nature more and more, His character, His attributes, His commands. See, by studying, we actually develop and grow in our belief, grow in our understanding, grow in our theology. And one of the things that's really happened, friends, is we've moved into a way of thinking where it's like, oh, I don't need all of that. I don't need all of that. It's just me and Jesus. I just need me and Jesus. I don't need all that other stuff. But the, the trap is, friends, that Jesus told us in order to be free, we had to know his teaching and obey them. So we need more than just simply an understanding of who Jesus is. We need to grow each and every day in our understanding, in our belief about who God is. Because, friends, everything you experience in this life, guilt, joy, doubt, peace, suffering, justice, injustice, all of it is going to be interpreted by your solid understanding of your theology and your biblical understanding. How you view suffering, how you view joy, all is going to be interpreted by what you believe is true about things like God and ourselves. I want you to remember this warning in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Paul told Timothy this, A time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They'll follow their own desires and they'll look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll reject the truth. And chase after myths. Now, does that sound familiar? Let me give you an example of how this plays out and why what we believe is important. There has been a rise over the last 30 to 40 years. Sociologists, missiologists have categorized a new group of uh, belief, and it's called moralistic therapeutic deism. Okay, it's a mouthful moralistic therapeutic theism but let me explain to you what they believe and then see if maybe you're more familiar with this first point of their belief is a god exists and he did create the world and he ordered the world um, and he watches over human life okay so it starts off good number two god wants people to be good nice and fair to each other as taught in the bible and by most other world religions number three the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in our life, except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And number five, good people go to heaven when they die. Now, friends, let me tell you something. This way of thinking, this theology, is the theology held by vast numbers of Christians and Americans, people who call themselves Christians, and people in our country. Well, if I live a good life, then I'll go to heaven. There's a God out there, but I don't think he cares so much about all of the other details of our life. And friends, let me tell you something. This is bad theology. See, what we believe matters. Each of these beliefs actually has consequences to them. What I mean by that is when you hold the belief in your mind, it actually affects affects how you live it out, how you walk it out. The beliefs that we hold make their way down. They trickle down through our lives in all kinds of different ways. Even the secular world understands this. I'm going to quote something that I never thought I would quote. It's not going on the screen, and it's not in your bulletin, because I don't want you to mishear this and think, oh, where are we going? Okay, I'm going to quote Gandhi. And the reason I'm quoting Gandhi is, again, this is the world's wisdom. 
And even they understand this. This is what Gandhi said. Your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. Your values become your destiny. Even the world understands that what we believe matters. And again, this is why what we believe is so important. It's why we've done this series. It's why we've tried to trickle down and understand what is at the core of our Christian belief. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to finish this thing off specifically looking at the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting. But I'm going to stick with this theme about how our theology about these things matters. In fact, what we're going to discover today is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is writing to the church who has problems with their theology, who has problems with their doctrine when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. And Paul is going to show us what the implications of these beliefs is in the life of a believer. So for a little background so that we are on the same page, Corinth was a Greek city. And the Greeks famously did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So when Paul, I'll give you another example, when Paul was preaching in the book of Acts in Athens, he starts talking about the resurrection of the dead with these intellectual Greeks. And do you know what they do? Look at uh, Acts 17, verse 32. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt. But others said, we want to hear more about this later. They actually laughed out loud at Paul when he started talking about the resurrection. It says they laughed in contempt, thinking, well, this guy's lost his mind. He's a lunatic. The resurrection of the dead, what is this guy talking about? And that way of thinking had made its way down from culture and into the local church. So we're going to see in Acts, I mean in uh, Corinthians um, chapter 15, Paul is going to have to address this problem. So here's how he begins, starting in uh, verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there's no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. See, there have always been, still to this day, happening then in Paul's day, people who denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus and the saints. And Paul <coughs> is here to challenge them by pointing out that if you say there's no resurrection, then that also then means that Jesus wasn't resurrected. If you say that there's no resurrection, it means Jesus wasn't resurrected. Because again, you can't say one is true without both of these being true. We go back to our very first lesson. It's called the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot be and not be true at the very same time. If there is no such thing as resurrection, then not only is Jesus not raised, but neither will you be. If Jesus is raised, that means also that we will be raised. See, it has to be one or the other. Both cannot be true. So here, Paul dives further into this question. Okay, well, let's just go down this trail of logic. Let's see where this way of believing and thinking takes us. What if Christ wasn't raised from the dead? Let's say you're right, and there's no such thing as resurrection. Here's the effect it will have on us. Verse 14, he said, If Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. See, Paul makes it very clear that our faith is dependent on the truthfulness of the resurrection. If you ever wonder <coughs> about the motives of those people who look to find fault in the resurrection of Christ, here it is. Every spring, right, we're coming up on this season. Every spring, you're going to see on various networks <coughs> shows like, in <coughs> sorry, investigating the resurrection, right? Remember these? You've seen these? History Channel loves this topic, investigating the resurrection. And inevitably, you're going to have some scholar who comes out and explains why the resurrection is metaphorical and never actually happened. Well, why? Because our entire faith is wrapped up in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without it, Paul says, our faith is useless, meaning it's vain, it's without meaning, it's meaningless. 
The Apostle Paul knew this to be true, and guess who else knows it to be true? The devil does. So he, from the very beginning, has been trying to convince people that the resurrection didn't really happen. Again, we talked about this a lot. The problem was there were so many witnesses. So many people saw it. So many people like you and I have testimonies to the truthfulness of it because Jesus is alive in and through us. There's so much eyewitness testimony that the devil just had to flat out make up lies about this. And he does it over and over again. So (coughs) Paul continues to solidify his position by saying that when we say Jesus is risen, if he really wasn't risen, listen to this, how strong his language is here, how important this is to Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, and we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. Paul says, then we're all liars. This is the options here, friends. Either all of the apostles are lying or it's true. He's not leaving them any wiggle room where in the church in Corinth they can say, yeah, but what about, no, he's saying, no, Jesus is risen. We are telling you that's the way that it is. So you either say that we are all liars or you receive this teaching. And Paul goes on to say, and again, here's the consequences to going down that road. If you want to say they're all liars and we don't receive it, then here's the consequences. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. He says if there's no resurrection, here's the results. Number one, Christ is still dead. Number two, your faith is worthless. Number three, we still live under the penalty of our sin. Number four, everyone who died in Christ is still dead. And five, we all who believe this stuff should be nothing but pitied. That's pretty strong. That's pretty convincing. Can you see why from Paul's argument, believing properly about the resurrection is so important? So now Paul's going to help them. He's going to move from this logical argument where he's been drawing them to this place, and now he's going to help them clear up their bad theology. He's going to help them clear up by pronouncing the truth. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So, I want you to notice something. Does he say, if Christ here? No, no. He's done with all the hypotheticals, right? He's done with the bad theology section. He says, in fact, Christ has been raised. Has been raised from the dead. Just as what? Scripture teaches. And because of that, friends, he's saying it is true. And because it's true, those who have died in him will be raised, which is why Jesus is called the first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits of the dead, the beginning of the greater harvest, so that through Jesus' death and resurrection, you and I have eternal life. Now, I can really geek out about this. I can... Let's do it. Let's go down the rabbit hole for a second. I love that in the Old Testament, all of these laws and festivals and practices were ultimately pointing us to Jesus and being fulfilled by and through Jesus. Jesus was crucified, as you remember, on Passover, and he rose from the dead on the third day. Does anybody know after Passover, on the third day in which Jesus rose from the dead, the day after the Sabbath, does anybody know what that festival was called for bonus points? First fruits. That's right. It was first fruits. On the day of his resurrection, men that were heads of the households of the Jewish homes would have been walking up the steps of the temple with a bushel of the first fruits of their harvest. The harvest was still standing in the field. This festival was different than the rest. It didn't come after harvest. It, they came with a bushel before the harvest to dedicate the whole harvest that was about to come to the Lord. The festival of first fruits. And guess what? 
on that very day, Jesus raises from the dead. And the Bible says he shows up and Mary Magdalene sees him. He says, whoa, don't touch me yet because I haven't yet gone to my father. And it, from there, Jesus ascends the steps of the temple in heaven and stands before his father as the acceptable sacrifice and first fruits of the harvest that is to come. It's amazing how God wove together all oh, this wonderful thing that we have in Scripture. Jesus tells us in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. See, friends, we're not talking about um, resi- um I'm going to lose this word now, and I practiced it all week. Res- resuscitation. We're talking about resurrection. I will not be raised from the grave with a tweaked neck and an aching hand. We're not getting uh, resuscitated. We're being resurrected. You will not wake up and be slow and tired and weak and afraid. You'll be resurrected. This is the place where we put our hope. This is the place where as Christians, we can face whatever comes at us in this life. Because friends, it, 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 it's so important that you all get this today. Our Christian hope lies in this. Philippians 1, 21 through 23. For to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which one's better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go be with Christ, which would be far better for me. See, this is where our hope in Christ lies, friends. You are going to be resurrected. This is the basis for our Christian courage. This is how we order our lives, friends. We have eternity, everlasting life. There'll be a new body and we'll get to experience life the way God originally designed and even better. You're not going to experience fear. You're not going to experience sickness. You're not going to need Tums anymore after you eat. You're not going to need to take an airborne to keep from getting sick. Friends, it's going to be really good. And that brings us to life everlasting. Let's take a look at it. Revelation 21. Let's read verse 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they'll be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it's finished. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. We are resurrected to life everlasting. And the thrust of Revelation 21 is that now my soul and my body are in the place that we were meant to be. We're in that place where we're with God. I'm with God. He's with me. It's not based on faith anymore. It's not based on hope anymore. He's literally there. You can see him. You can feel him. You can experience him. You don't have to place your faith in it anymore. Your faith is fully realized and fulfilled. This is life everlasting, friends. Verse 4, he'll wipe away every tear from your eyes, and there'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. That is life everlasting. No more funerals. No more breaking news. No more pandemics. Death 
is done. In fact, this is so radical that later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul just openly mocks death. This is what he says. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? See, friends, there's no more tears. There's no more death. There's no more death of any kind. There's no more sorrow. You know, some translations say mourning. There's no more mourning. And you can mourn and be filled with sorrow here on this earth about all kinds of different stuff. Let me ask you, has anyone here ever found their heart in mourning over something that later you thought was silly? My hand's up. We mourn all kinds of stuff here on this earth. We mourn loss, and it's right to mourn. In fact, the Bible tells us on this side of heaven that we have permission to mourn, that there's a season for mourning. In the fallen world, there's a time and a season for this. But there's coming a day where there will no longer be any mourning. Everlasting life looks like this. You'll never again say, oh man, that hurts. There'll never be something to mourn. It says there's no crying or pain. Have you ever known or had a loved one that struggled with pain or been in pain yourself? Have you ever watched someone struggle and had nothing you could do about it? It's an awful thing. Do you know what everlasting life with Christ looks like? All that is gone. Pain of all kinds, physical, emotional, mental, all kinds of pain. Sadness will be gone forever. Amen. Is this good news for anyone else here? It's like, oh, no, it's pretty gone. All these things, friends, are gone forever. You want to know what everlasting life looks like? I get giddy about this, friends. How many of you have been marked by some kind of tragedy that's happened in your life? How many of you have had an event that's taken place at some point in your life where even though you've made progress, that event to this day, you're still trying to process it, you're still trying to work through it, you're still trying to recover from it. There's an event that's taken place that your whole life has been marked by and shaped by. Friends, as a church family, we've been through a lot together. Sudden tragic accident. We've mourned the loss of children. We've mourned family members. We've experienced murder and suicide and divorce and terrible injuries, cancers. I've been a pastor here for nine years, and I've been part of this church family from the first day it started in 1988. And together, we have been through a lot. You want to know what everlasting life looks like? All of that pain, all of that suffering, all of that mourning, all of those tears are gone forever. Revelation 21, 5, and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And he said to me, write this down. What I'm telling you is trustworthy and true. Listen to what he says. It is finished. It's done. It's finished. The wrestle. The struggle, the fight, it's done forever. A resurrected body living in life everlasting. Now, this is all super good news, but let's make it practical now. Let's make it super practical for us today. Some of us who are here today, even those that love Jesus, have put undue hope in things that could never deliver what they are promising to do for you. And when you place your hope in the wrong places, what we end up with is seeing our anxiety, our restlessness, our fear, our disappointment, all increasing in our life. See, we try to manipulate and control our situations, our relationships, our lives, but friends, the truth is, none of those things that we place our hope in on this side of heaven can ever produce for you the hope that your soul is longing for. When we don't rely on the Lord, when we rely on us, we end up in a huge mess. Let me ask you, friends, where is your hope? What are you placing your hope in? Your ultimate hope. Where is your hope? Is it in the frantic activity and the pace of life that you find yourself in? Is it in your career? Is it in your kids? Is it in things that are good but ultimately should never have been given the place that you've given them in your hope and in your heart? You know, I think one of the things we need to do 
is we need to learn a really challenging um, discipline. And I, this discipline, I'm going to just call it, we need to learn how to look at our life from 10,000 years in the future. Now, I'm going I'm to help you with this. I'm going to give you a tool for this here in just a second. But I think if we could look at our lives from you can put out, you can put a million or a billion. I just think 10,000 was an easier number for me to wrap my, I can't wrap my mind around any of this. So I want to look at my life from 10,000 years in the future. I want to look back on the moment of today. And I want to see how will I interpret what's happening today when I'm down the road and have been with Christ in his uh, presence in perfection with all of my needs met, with every longing that I ever had satisfied, with every joy that I ever could possibly think of or imagine over the top provided for. In that place, when I look back on the moment that I injured my hand in 2009, what will I be thinking about it then? got a tool here that has been helpful for me. I've used this. Uh, actually, this rope was purchased when I was a youth group leader. I've used it for this lesson enough times that it still has the right color here on the end of it. Now, I stole this analogy from Francis Chan. Um, I've used it a lot as a youth leader, and I'm going to share it with you guys today. So I want you to imagine that this rope is the timeline of your existence, okay? So this rope is like a timeline. And it goes on and on for all eternity, okay? On and on, but it, my eternity's caught here for a second, for a second. Okay, perfect. It goes on and on for all eternity. Now, it doesn't really, it ends in a big mess over there, but just pretend for with me for a moment that this rope goes on and on for all of eternity. Here's the thing. This little red section is your life here on earth. You see it right here? This is your life here on earth, right here at the top of the rope. But a lot of us get messed up in our thinking and that we're thinking like this, like here, here at this point in my life, I'm going to get this job and then I'm going to save right here for this point in my life so that I can retire. Oh, retirement's going to be great. This point in my life here, I'm really going to do a lot of fun stuff. I'm going to travel during this point in my life. I'm going to see the sides. I'm going to eat good food. It's going to be great. I'm really living for this point in my life. When all of eternity, friends, lies ahead of us. We place our hope and our focus and our attention only on that which is right in front of us. Now, we are supposed to be present in our life. But our hope needs to be not just in what we experience in this life, but friends, we're told in Scripture that the things we do in this red part are going to affect all of eternity the beliefs that we hold, the things that we do are going to go on and on and on. Our life doesn't end at the end of the red point. Our life goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And friends, that is reason for us to take seriously, to take seriously our hope, to take seriously our faith, to take seriously where you're placing your hope. I promise you, after billions and billions and billions and billions of years spent with Christ, I will not look back and say, June 26, 2009, you weren't fair. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Because I'll be able to see with clarity how God used the events of my life to shape me, to mold me, to help me, to teach me, to be reliant, to help me, to learn how to persevere. With all of this, to look back, we're going to see with clarity, friends. I understand. For some of you, the stuff happening in here is hard. But this isn't the end of it, friends. Can you see while people who were writing songs when they were held in captivity and slavery in the American South can you see why so many of their songs are about the second coming of Jesus? Because they had hope for something more than what they were experiencing. Friends, this is important for you and I right now. Life here can be hard. It's not all there is. So where are you placing your hope? Where are you placing 
your trust? That's the question that I have for us to consider today. Where are you placing your ultimate hope? Where are you? And where are you misplacing your hope? And what things are you looking to provide hope for you that never, ever could? And my second one, and this one's important too, is in what ways have you shown a lack of concern for the eternity of your soul and the soul of others? Do you take, it would be an etern, eternality, would be the correct term. Do you take sin lightly? Have you categorized things God says he hates as no big deal in your life? What about the souls of other people? Is there urgency in your heart for people to live this part of their life with God instead of without? Is there something driving us to really taking seriously the fact that we will live forever, friends? Now, this isn't meant to be a drive-by guilt answer, right? I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to make you examine your heart, trying to get us to think about our thinking, right? So that we're not just simply going through life as if the world does as if this is it and all that matters. Because when you really understand this timeline, going across the street and telling my neighbors about a trunk or treat seems to be a pretty small thing. Right? You're like, oh, but if I do that, they, right here on this thing, they might think I'm weird. I know we chuckle at this, but isn't it funny how easy it is for this type of thinking to really take over in our life? So friends, you're going to live forever, one way or another. I want you to live with me and with so many of our friends in eternity with Christ, where there's no more tears, there's no more suffering, there's no more pain. But some of us are so casual about this that I'm afraid you're going to miss the opportunity. Because you have no idea what tomorrow looks like in this red part. We're clear on what this part looks like. But you've got no idea what this part is going to be next. And I just want to encourage you as we finish this series. What you believe matters. Band, you can come back up. And if you're here today and you have not really fully committed yourself, your life, over to God and said, Lord, I believe. I love the little thing that we learn in the Bible from, uh, from the centurion. He says, I believe God, but help my unbelief, right? I just want to encourage you, friends. Let's today be a people who make this commitment together. I'll put my faith and my trust in Christ alone. And I'll allow him to disciple me and to train me. I'll commit to the things that he asks me to. I'll be obedient to his word. And in doing so, I'll live for all eternity with him. So let me ask you this question as we begin to pray. In what areas are you misplacing your hope? And in what places are you not taking the reality of eternity seriously when it comes to your own life? and the lives of others. Let's pray. Lord, I'm asking you that you would help us right now. I believe this is one of those times and one of those places, God, where our world is just so, our world is so mixed up in all of this, God. We have an enemy who's trying desperately to get people and steal people away. So Lord, here's my prayer for my friends. I pray that we would hope in Christ alone. Reveal to us, God, where we're placing our hope in our security, in our country, in our retirements, in our bank accounts, in our kids, whatever it might be. Reveal these things to us, God. To help us to place our hopes in Christ alone. 
And Lord, I just pray that right now you'd give us a renewed zeal for the reality that our friends, our family members, our neighbors are all going to spend eternity with or without you. I pray for your help in this, God. I pray that we would live our life with our eyes set on the prize, that we would run with perseverance the race laid out before us, that we would not allow the sin that so easily entangles us to, to make us fall, that we will be a people who with our vision set solely on you will keep on running. I pray that you help us in this, in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. We have the cross. We have communion. We have candles. Let's just respond to the Lord. However he's leading you today, however he's speaking to you today, come and respond. Let's continue to worship.
just want to encourage you, if you're here today and you've never made the decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to declare that you believe He is who He says He is, just want to encourage you right now, right where you're at, let's just pray together. And if you're here today and you're saying, yeah, I believe I want to live eternity with God, I just want to encourage you in your own heart, just pray this prayer. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you died for my sin. And I believe that you rose again from the dead. I declare today that you are my Lord and my Savior. And I need your help now to figure all that out. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let's take the eternal nature of our life, our spirit, our soul seriously. Let's not be so casual about our faith. Let's grow, let's read, let's press in, let's listen, let's do, let's be the people of God. Part of that is being connected with other believers. I just want to encourage you that if you're here today and you are not yet in a small group, or maybe you're in one, and you're like, it's just not a great fit. That's okay. Come meet some other people. We would love to connect you, and we'd love to get to know you better. We'd love to see you build relationships that will last for all eternity. So, the rally is in the entryway. I'm going to release you now to go in peace and serve the Lord.